Welcome everyone, Costini here with a discussion about battles in Total War, Warhammer 3 Immortal Empires and why they aren't so great. But believe it or not, the reason battles are not so great in Warhammer 3 actually has little to do with the battles themselves. Sure, plenty of people obsess about things about balancing and AI, pathfinding, cheesing, etc, etc. But the real fundamental problems the way I see them, be it in siege battles or open field battles, is not really what's happening in those battles. To be clear, sieges are dull, boring, forgettable, and not interesting at all. Many field battles are just the same. But the reason they are like that is because we as players, and this has been going on for many years in Total War, in fact, we can go all the way back to Rome 1, because this would take place in Rome 1 as well. It's not a recent invention. But for many, many years, what has become very clear in Total War is that the way you want to play the game in order to succeed and win a campaign on any difficulty is to optimize and become more efficient as a player. Now, the specifics of this have varied in, from game to game. In Medieval 2, for instance, it was getting artillery as quickly as possible so you could break down castle walls do a significant amount of damage than being able to storm your uh, storm the the walls, the gaps in the walls, and kill as many enemy units while taking as little damage as possible on your own army. In Empire, this meant uh, achieving fire superiority so you could win battles on minimal casualties, and this continued all the way until Shogun 2, because the inherent nature of Shogun 2 is very similar to Empire, very similar to Napoleon. Then came Warhammer, and really, what we've seen over the years again and again and again is there are certain playstyles that do allow you to achieve campaign success and certain playstyles that will push you towards fla failure. Ever since the introduction of legendary difficulty in Shogun 2, we certainly have been pushed very hard in the direction of playing in such a way as to minimize our own losses, magnify the enemy losses. It's an all or nothing affair in the way we play battles, in the way we play campaigns, in the way we play sieges. The worst kind of battle that you can fight in a campaign is, the ba is a battle where you take a significant amount of damage and a good portion of the enemy army escapes. So you want to fight battles of annihilation. So for instance, there was a garrison here that Archeon had, and I had every incentive to win this battle, the siege battle over here for his capital, with minimal casualties. Because I knew, not because I was using Toggle, uh, toggle Fog of War, but because there was an objective that was marking where Archeon was. Uh, that objective was to kill an enemy lord he had. Uh, but there was an objective indicating that Archeon was over here. So I know Archeon is going to attack me next turn. So I have every single incentive as a player to minimize the casualties here in order to prepare for the next round of fighting. That is my intent over here. I could not afford going into this battle. And even if I fight Archeon, and I do manage to win, it would not be ideal if I lost half my army in the process. So this pushes you as a player further and further and further and further along this narrow path where you are pushed again and again and again by the series as a whole in virtually every game that's been in the series to fight battles of annihilation, to fight conclusive, decisive battles where you take the minimal amount of damage and maximize the enemy damage. It doesn't matter if the game in question has casualty replenishment, doesn't matter what that casualty replenishment is. In point of fact, some people want to argue that, oh, if we lowered casualty replenishment, it would, would be better. No, it would not, wouldn't be. If the game's lowered casualty replenishment, that would push players even further down that path because it meant each and every single casualties you suffered and the casualty you suffered in battle would have a significant impact. What we want as players when we're playing a campaign is we want to achieve as much as possible as quickly as possible. And every kind of limitation or proposal limitation, all it would really do is push players even further down the path of adopting a particularly bad playstyle. Not that the current playstyles for certain races are that great, considered the dwarves. Like unmodded dwarves. So this is a modded campaign, but unmodded dwarves. 
There is no better army to make as the dwarves than a quarreler army with grudge throwers and eventually cannons, organ guns, and heroes. But the a mainstay of the army is quarrelers. Some people say, oh, we introduced an unit caps. It will not change it. You would, the main, like you could have, I could have half the quarrelers of this army and it wouldn't change anything about how I'm playing the battles. Like, yeah, if I had more melee units, this army would be less effective, but I would still be relying on these quarrelers on any kind of range units for any range faction to do as much damage as possible against an enemy. There are melee-centric factions that do very well, but the way the Warriors of Chaos do so very, very well is they have powerful magic, they have an incredible level of power in their armies, incredible versatility in their melee. A Warriors of Chaos army controlled by the player will tend to do extremely well against any kind of AI army, just because you can rush the enemy before they do a lot of damage, you can cheese the way they are shooting at you, you go in, you engage in melee, you wipe them out. In fact, I'm not quite sure I can defeat Archeon's army over here. So those are some of the things to keep in mind. Now, people have uh, some people have called it optimizing the fun out of the, ga out of the game. My perspective on that subject is that, well, Creative Assembly has optimized the fun out of the game because Creative Assembly has created a perverse incentive structure. We want to win quickly because we don't have the resources needed to compete with AI one on one. We just don't. Like if we're playing on any kind of high difficulty in the game, we do not have the resources. If you play uh, slowly, if you don't accomplish a lot, you will just be overwhelmed and die. This is precisely what would happen in Shogun 2 in particular, and then in other games as well. Now you can say, well, only a portion of the player base handles a legendary, but the kind of fundamental idea that if you don't expand aggressively to a degree or another, you, uh, the idea that you're going to fall behind if you don't do it, that does apply on virtually every difficulty. You will achieve more in your campaign if you are aggressive in that campaign. So for instance, over here, look at this. I have every hero type. I have 31 Grum Brindle. I have gold ranked units across this, the board over here. I have some really powerful armies that I have at my disposal in this particular campaign and that are just simply put going to do, going to be able to accomplish a significant amount uh, very quickly over here uh, during this uh, campaign. I'll, I think I'll actually get the fame. So the issue beyond like people talking about ladders or layouts or how range units should be protected and all that, I feel that is relatively meaningless. What ruins siege battles and what ruins battles in general is the, the fact that we are fighting these battles of annihilation. That every single time we go in a siege, we're not thinking about, oh, how could this be interesting? No, all we are thinking about as a player, we know we're going to win a battle. Like I knew, for instance, like just to give you an idea, I knew that over here attacking Archeon's capital, I would win the battle. The only question that existed in my mind is what kind of casualties would I take and would I be able to take minimal damage? I w did manage to win this battle with minimal damage. You're not, we're not fighting battles because the battles themselves are interesting. Very few battles are actually interesting. Very few battles require actual strategy and tactics. And generally speaking, those kind of battles are battles where you're on number two to one, three to one. That's when you might uh, have to when you might have to pull through, or maybe a battle like this where you're up against a legendary lord with a non-legendary lord. Though to be honest, in this case, I would say I would give Archon a run for his money. But extremely few battles are interesting, in particular for your legendary or lord army. Your legendary lord is generally going to win. What about endgame crisis armies? Crisis armies. Yeah, those could be interesting to some extent, but you know they're not real armies created by the AI. You know that there's some kind of limit to uh, those armies. Like, for instance, over here I have the <laughs> Castorf uh, Endgame Crisis, and it's like, um, let, let's just put it like this. Uh, Grimgor is winning against the Castorf Endgame Crisis. Yeah. yeah, that is uh, that is uh, certainly a bit of a hilarious situation. It's like, oh, the in-game crisis started. It's like, okay, Grimgor is coming. Okay, so much for that notion. 
there's so much for the idea that uh, the Chaos Dwarf Endgame Crisis was going to amount to anything against Grimgore. Uh, probably not. Actually, it's even more hilarious when you think about it. It's like Ungrim's taken out Astrogoth. Uh, Drazov's still going strong, but uh, and so is A10, but it's like Zarnagrund has fallen, so, suffice to say. I'll arrive, like, it's kind of a hilarious situation. It's like, I'll arrive here and the main threat will be Grimgore. But Grimgore is an exception. Like, Grimgore is the only AI controlled character that can actually give a player a run for a money when you go up against grimgore 1v1 you are going to feel the challenge this is a guy that it will pulverize you like he the the stats grimgore has the sheer amount of power he has the charge bonus he has he hits as hard as cavalry and he's a single entity unit that's kind of difficult to kill really uh, in, in quite a few ways. And he's genuinely a hero and lord killer. So you've got to be really damn careful when you're dealing with him. But Grungor is an exception. He isn't the rule that you do deal with in a campaign. In fact, he is very much the opposite. Others, and, and this of course depends on whether or not Grungor even achieves a lot in his campaign. In this case, he actually hasn't achieved necessarily as much as you might think. Like, yeah, he's thrown his hordes against Arnagrun, but he's got... Uh, very little left beyond that so so it's not really something that's going to hap uh, happen very well like I think one of the ways that this could be changed is if we had better resources as players to compete with AI and we don't on, and, and on no difficulty do we have that and if the game structure wasn't designed in such a way that we need to fight battles, we need that post-battle loot, we need the experience. We need constant, 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 constant stream of battles to level up our heroes, our lords, our armies. If we didn't have that kind of incentive structure, that in itself would improve the situation. Another issue is the map itself of Immortal Empires and also Realms of Chaos. Elements are just close enough, to, uh, close, too close to each other. You can't believe just how much more enjoyable something like the old old world campaign is compared to this just because you aren't constantly fighting one battle after another. Another factor in this is that settlements by default have an auto resolve benefit. All settlements have an auto resolve benefit. That doesn't match reality because it pushes you towards the player of fighting a lot of these settlement battles, wall settlements, or sieges, unwalled settlements. It pushes you towards fighting them. You're not fighting battles because you want to fight them. You're fighting them because if you do auto resolve them, you're going to take. 10 times the casualties, potentially. That is a fairly broken balance, and that's a fairly broken system. There are mods that do fix this, mind you. Like, in this campaign, I certainly have fought battles, manually, Valkyrie and others. Um, but the only siege battle I had to fight with the mods was the one over here. And the only reason I had to fight it is because I knew Archeon was going to be coming here, so I wanted to minimize my casualties. Mods can help, but they cannot fix the uh, intrinsic issues that a game may have and i hear a lot of people talking about oh what if they remove the ass ladders i never use ass ladders ever in any campaign i never bother attacking the walls i never bother using siege towers do you know why a unit on a wall you're gonna it's you might as well send them to their deaths like if you're assaulting the walls of a fortress and you're sending a unit on the wall unless it's some lord like Grimgore or Archeon or Malice Darkblade in which case even then it's like why are you sending them on the wall when you can send them for the gate if you're sending someone on the wall you're going to ensure they become a big target for all the enemy range units and they're going to be stuck on that wall without any kind of chance of retreat so why would you send units on the walls there's no real reason behind it oh buff gate hp doesn't change a fucking thing really and by the way they did buff gate, gate hp and they actually made sieges worse for that oh ass ladders i'll tell you why i don't use ass ladders this is this is the or siege towers they s destroy the pathfinding that exists in the game so if you put ladders the worst things that can happen is someone puts a ladder up on, on a wall or a siege tower on a wall in that case when you or give a movement order for units to get inside the settlement, from outside the settlement, let's say you're the defender, the AIs put some towers and ladders, all that. You sally out, do some damage, but you want to go back in. You will see your own units go climbing those ladders and towers instead of just going through the open gate. Then you might control. I've seen this time and again. If you ever assault a settlement and use ladders or towers, it's a waste of time. 
there's never been a t good uh, a Total War game where now is worth it. Uh, and you might say, oh, Medieval 2 forced you because it had boiling oil. Um, okay, fair enough. You know how you solve that in Medieval 2? Uh, pretty simple. You got catapults. You would got trebuchets. You got ballistae. You smashed open the walls. You attacked the least defended section of the walls through those gaps. Attacking the main gate in Medieval 2 was suicidal. I grant you that. But that's why you didn't do it. So all those defenses, you just bypass those defenses. Or that was the best way to play. Some people are like, well, just limit the amount of siege. That is so ridiculous. And Siege is going to remain broken as long as we have this uh, this incentive structure in the game where we want to take settlements every turn, ideally. You want to fight battles every single turn, ideally. We want to maximize our faction potential because that's the only way we compete against AI cheats. That's how we overcome the AI cheats. And this is not just something exclusive to Warhammer 3. This has been the situation in many Total War games. Now, some people say, oh, just take it slow. And I'm like, there's never been a Total War game where taking it slow has ever been a great idea. There's been some mods that are trying to artificially slow you down. Okay, they can art try and artificially slow you down. But ultimately, even with those mods, playing aggressively was still the order of the day. It's an inherent issue with the way Total War does play that you are pushed heavily towards aggression because of all the rewards aggression gives you. Extra territory, extra land. Sure, how aggressive you can be may depend on a game, may depend on a map, uh, may depend on your faction, but generally speaking, being aggressive against the enemy is the smart thing to do. And it's also historically accurate if you want to go for that, as opposed to sitting on your ass. Uh, and the way sieges work is also not really that great. Like the idea that every siege, some people push this idea that every siege should be a difficult, like should have like, a, I don't know, a 20 man garrison. There are settlements with powerful garrisons, absolutely. Um, but if you look at historic sieges, there are plenty of sieges which were a cakewalk for anyone attacking a particular place because they were not prepared. They didn't have the manpower, they didn't have the ammunition. Yes, arrows matter. And it, they were far more difficult to make and far more, uh, far more time consuming to make uh, than you might believe. A uh, ammunition, they didn't have the ammunition, they didn't have the food, they didn't have the water. Uh, generally speaking, when you look at the sieges where that lasted for any length of time, the defender was heavily prepared for a particular siege. But there's just as many sieges, if not far more so, where an army, a powerful army, would show up to a castle, to a strong point in a town, and they would just open the gates surrender or they negotiate their surrender something that by the way is severely lacking in total war now sure i understand that uh, let's say the empire wouldn't uh, surrender to chaos for instance or the greenskins as an example but there's plenty of cases where that could work and i'm not just thinking about warhammer for i'm thinking about total war in general the idea this blood craze that we do have going on in these kind of games is kind of infuriating the way uh, the way it's played, it's unrealistic. Most people that died in war didn't die in actual battle. They died from disease. They died from an army being routed trying to escape. They died from wounds and hunger. Uh, and concerning the Napoleonic War uh, wars, most soldiers did not die in battle. The vast majority of them did not die in battle or through um, guerrilla tactics or for anything like that. They died from disease, just like that. That that's a simple reality. Now, of course, many of them died from wounds. They sustained the battles, infection, etc. But all the same. That's not something Total War does very well. That's not something any other game does very well either. So I think that's that's a conversation I think should be had as opposed to like l removing ass ladders will fix sieges or doubling gate HP or introducing unit caps or anything like that. Any of those artificial limitations would just make things far more frustrating and would not fix the underlying issue. We don't fight battles because we enjoy them. In a lot of cases, I, I think I speak for a lot of people when I say sieges are utter rubbish in Warhammer 3. We don't fight them because we enjoy them. We fight them because we have to. And people saying, oh, they should be more annoying, I think they're missing the point. That's where I stand. Kostin, signing out.